can. So I go back in the house and I have three boys and I have a daughter and I look at the three boys and I said, put your coats on, I want you to come out in the garage with me. We'll go out and get the garage. Now I got Jamie, he's my oldest, and Joey, he's my special needs, and then I got Corey, he's the baby. He's 32 now, but he's the baby. So they all go out there and I take them in the closet and they're standing there like. And I said, do you gentlemen see this wet spot here? And it was a pretty sizable wet spot. And they go, yeah. And I look at Jamie and I say, Jamie, do you know how this wet spot came here? Yeah. How many of you have children? Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna get, when they're telling the truth, they're gonna look you right in the eye. Jamie looks me in the eye and he goes, I have no idea, Dad. And I said, you can go back inside. And that leaves Joey and that leaves Corey. Now, Corey's, Joey's got Asperger's. Joey doesn't know how to lie. If Joey says, I don't know, Joey, you're lying. Just, just tell me the truth, okay. So I look at Joey and I said, Joey, do you know how this wet spot got here? And when they're looking for the right answer, they look up. Not that they're lying, they look up and Joey's looking up, they go, I have no idea. I said, you can go back in. And that leaves my baby out there. Corey Michael, do you have any idea how this wet spot got here? Now when they look down, they do this, they're looking for a lie. Believable. He says, now I raised my kids the same way I did. The truth will set you free. Right? Well, officer, what happens? I was driving 127, slowing down when you go. He goes, well, he says, what happens? John and I were out here playing today. Boys will have to reason like this. You ladies don't reason like this. He says, we were out here playing today. We were really having a good time, Dad. We got out playing, out, and we got playing, and, and, he, and he said, <laughs> and I, I knew I had to go to the bathroom, but we were having so much fun. We got, now the bathroom is just about 22 feet away. But when boys get playing, they get playing. He says, and, and he says, finally I couldn't hold it anymore. He says, I peed on the floor. I said, thank you for being honest. You can go inside now. You see what happens when the truth sets you free. Character fall, character flaw. Police officer gave me 75 and a 55. Caught me doing 87, I topped out at 127. Well, the officer, the truth is, you caught me slowing down. Jesus. None of us is without error. That's why we have the law. It protects us, even when it punishes us for doing wrong. And the flexibility is built into the law so that perhaps the penalty might be less, Sometimes the judge is going to take off his robe and stand next to us. You can always have your sentence commuted. When I got out of the military, I was walking, working in a county jail at a jail alcohol program. This young man James, named John Glenn, not, not the guy who went up in space. This was a drunk. And John's, John's fame to crime was he would break into empty warehouses in the middle of winter to stay warm. They were abandoned warehouses. Someone owned them, but no one was doing anything in them. And he'd get, he get busted, and they'd put him in jail, and for the winter he'd have three, cots and a, three hots and a cot. And this happened to be the time in the 70s when we were done with the violence in the streets, with the anti-war, with the civil war, with all that. We were done with it, and so we called it the law and order movement. We get the capital punishment. I'll talk about it in more detail. And John, sure enough, broke into, a, count, uh, into a, a, a warehouse and got busted. And, and the law said three times the same crime, you go to prison for life. And I remember writing a letter to the judge. I can still see his face. He read my letter in the courtroom. He says, I know some of you aren't going to agree with this decision. He read my letter and he said, but the law is the law. It was called time of law and order. And he sent John to Marquette Prison, the oldest prison east of the Mississippi. As far as I know, John's still there for breaking into a warehouse to stay warm. Was John wrong? Yeah, John was wrong. He broke the law. As long as it was a just law. That's someone else's property. John did wrong. Now, should a sentence be commuted? Should he be let out of jail? Well, some of us think so, but he broke the law. I don't know what the law says. There's a man in upstate New York right now holding a kilo of heroin. You know what a kilo is? That's a lot of weight. That's not personal use. He was selling it. He's doing 25 to life. There's another fellow in the same prison doing 15 to 25 for manslaughter, killing someone. Is there something wrong with the law? They both violated the law and they're both doing the time that the law prescribes. One for holding too much weight and one for taking someone's life off the planet. 
holding too much weight, doing 25 to life, taking someone's life off the planet, 15 to 25. So here's the point of this. Morality compels us. The moral conscience compels us to face the laws that are unjust and deal with them. We're going to have unjust laws because we have people that aren't perfect. We're going to do things that in retrospect we shouldn't have done. The status of morality is the recognition then that we all have a moral conscience and there's times that moral conscience will place us in a position where we resist the unjustness of the law even if we have to pay the penalty for resisting, hoping that in that resistance we come to a point of agreement and we change the law. So women have the right to vote. No more slavery. Equal pay for equal work. Civil protections under the law. And there's more changes that need to be made because we'll continue to make law. And without the willingness to face the error of our ways, we're never going to make the law respond to the needs of the people. And that's the whole point of the law, is to get the law to protect the people who follow the law. Everybody follow what's at stake here. Anybody not agree with that assessment of what morality is and how that differs from ethics? How many of you feel like you have a moral conscience? Just a handful? It's okay if you do yeah, It's okay to raise your hand. What would your moral conscience say? Well, Professor Poller, I didn't have time to do my quiz today. Could you extend me another day or two? What would your moral conscience say? I mean, this is applied ethics, right? We're, we're not in theory. We're, what should my conscience say? No. Why? Because you said there's a time limit, and that's due by that date. I did. I tried to conform you to the law. That's why I put that in there. Go ahead. Say what? Can't hear you. I would say yes, and like open it. Like Is he wrong? Well, that's your choice. Yeah. That's what I was talking about. Is yourself. You have the ability to change. I do, don't I? Well, it's your rules, yeah. It's my rules. And I ask you to all abide by my rules. And then that cop gave me a 75 and a 55. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When I work for the county jail, they give you... Anybody... Have, well, I'm not going to ask that. That's rhetorical. Anyway, anyway, when you work for the county jail, they used to give you an ID card. And it looked just like the road officer's cards. You know. Well, this is a license. And at the time, I had a wallet where you could open it up. And so I took my county card and I put it right next to it. And I'm driving through St. Joseph's in the Porsche. And I think I'm past the city limit. And of course, that Porsche has no limitations. So it, and a county officer stopped me. He comes up to the car. He says, can I see your license and registration? So I open my wallet. And there's my license. And there's my Ingham County Jail. But I'm not a road officer. I'm a chief therapist at alcohol program. He goes, oh, are you, are you a road officer? I said, no, sir, I'm not, but I do work in Ingham County Jail. I work for Sheriff Predmore. And he looks at my card and he says, make sure you keep it slow. The boys in blue, the state police, the ones that gave me 75 and 55, probably going to be out looking for you today. I had a really nice light green colored Porsche, just, just like red, just through their eyeballs right away. He let me go. I was speeding again. Let me go. Broke the law. Let me go. Jesus. It's kind of an aura. It's part of that blue aura I have, you know. <laughs> I got other times, too, where they do that. It's really been interesting. Once up at Kinross, which is a prison in the UP where we put CSCs, criminal sexual conducts, people who molest little kids. We had to take them out of the population and put them, because the population had rules too. In prison, you don't molest kids. You, you'll get, no one will see it happen, but you will get killed. So we put them all in their own house up north. And we're coming out, and, and the, the lights, I mean, this is out in the country. And there's no lights and down south in the, in the lower peninsula. There's no lights out on the road, and you can do 45. So I go right up to 45. Boop, 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 county, county pulls me over. Any idea how fast you're going? I was doing 45. Do you know it's a 35 mile an hour speed limit? And I said, well, down below? He says, yeah, well, we're not down below. <laughs> we call that above in the UP. 
I said, well, I didn't know that officer. And he said, well, just, he said, what are you doing? So I told him, we were visiting the prison. He says, well, just make sure you keep it under 35 till you get down to the barbecue house at the end of the road. You can't separate morality from ethics. They're handmaidens to one another, but they're not equal people. Every day you live, you live in the light of the law, but you also live in the light of your own conscience. And if your conscience won't speak up, then you need to believe someone else's conscience will. That's the only way the law changes. When someone recognizes that the law is not fulfilling its promise, the promise of the law is to increase freedom to the greatest degree for the greatest number of people, as long as we obey the law. When we have bad laws, we have a moral obligation to change them, to recognize it first and take responsibility for it. And this is the hardest part. Who wants to admit this? How many among us want to admit that there's a failure in character? And I'm the professor. I record these. I've suggested to other professors, why don't you record your lecture? What if I say something wrong? You think because it's not on celluloid, people aren't going to figure out you said something that's wrong? <laughs> I'm going to say something wrong periodically. You're, hopefully you, you'll correct me. It's going to happen. I'm not going to jump down your throat. I accept the plate. I'm a dinosaur. I accepted this a long time ago. But we're talking about ethics. We're talking about how we choose to live with one another. And we can't abide by injustice if the whole point of ethics is justice. That's why we have to box people. That's how important the law is. Because we're not all perfect and we're not all good. And so the status of morality then probably becomes the key to how we live with one another. That's just the law. We need the law, but it's the moral conscience that goes along with the law. And the landscape of human history has been that when we realize there's something wrong, even when there's resistance and great pain and great cost, there are people still in prison who haven't committed murder. And we haven't let them out yet because we haven't figured it out because we don't want to figure it out. The court will never go back and re-examine cases because if the court admits it made one mistake, every one of those cases is going to come up for re-examination. They don't want to spend the time or the money or the effort. So we have the Innocence Project and other projects with moral conscience like Dr. King was talking about do the legwork for them. And at least we found 151, maybe 153 we've set free. We may have executed those that didn't deserve to die and we may have more to set free. We don't know. Well, how come I got stopped and he didn't? Because you got stopped. And you were breaking the law. That's why you got stopped. And then we add in things like prejudice. Twelve angry men. Those are anybody going to do twelve angry men? And how you eliminate prejudice in the courtroom? You don't eliminate prejudice in the courtroom. Not if we're fractured. You minimize it. You have a moral standard that forces you to minimize your own biases and prejudices. You're never going to eliminate them. And I give a whole new meaning to ethics. And you're all glad you signed up for this, aren't you? Your deepest fear is not that you're inadequate. Your deepest fear is that you're powerful beyond measure. It's the light, not the darkness, that frightens us. Playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that we don't intimidate people around us. We're all meant to shine as children. 